This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. The world's rhinos are in crisis, constantly under threat of poaching for their horns. At the start of the 20th century, about 500,000 rhinos roamed the wild. Currently, less than 29,000 remain. Four of the five species remaining are classified as threatened. Three are also critically endangered, which means they could go extinct in our lifetime. Poaching has skyrocketed in recent years due to cultural demands for rhino horn, while the ban on its international trade has caused the black market price to surpass the value of gold. This week on Talk Africa, we'll find out whether current conservation methods are effective and if drastic measures like legalizing the rhino horn trade will save the species. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, with only 29,000 rhinos remaining, the five surviving species are spread across sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. White rhino numbers are estimated at at least 21,000. The greater one-horned stands at about 3,550. 5,455 black rhinos remain, while the Sumatran and the Javan rhinos are both less than 200. Now, South Africa is home to approximately 80% of the world's rhino population. Between 2008 to 2017, more than 7,000 rhinos were killed by poachers in South Africa alone. In just a decade, more than 7,245 African rhinos have been lost to poaching. In 2016, a rhino was poached every eight hours in South Africa to supply the growing demand for horn which can fetch as much as 47,000 US dollars per pound. An average rhino bull's front horn is about 16 pounds. That's roughly 700,000 US dollars. The back horn is a third of the weight of the front horn, fetching close to a million dollars on the black market. Well, there's a lot to talk about and joining me to discuss the rhino horn trade we have michael sars rolls from oxford he's a conservation economist in johannesburg is pelham jones he's the chairman of the private rhino owners association and from cape town zoologist dr john hanks thank you gentlemen for joining us on the program i'll start off with you uh, pelham jones in johannesburg because 150 years ago africa's savannas uh, teamed with about a million uh, black and white rhinos today Today, there are only about 29,000 rhinos in existence. We have reports that for five years, African rhinos have been poached at a rate of three per day. So Pelham Jones, has the 1977 CITES ban that outlawed trade in rhino horn worked? Well, by any reasonable measure, it has been an absolute dismal failure. And you just have to look at the scoreboard. The fact that we estimate an excess of 100,000 rhino have been killed in the last 40, 50 odd years. The fact that South Africa in the last 10 years has lost over uh, uh, 8,000 rhino. If you look at the fact that there were uh, some 33 range states with rhino, so 23 of them in fact no longer have rhino. Many countries, Tanzania included, who used to have very substantive populations are down to less than 100 animals. Uganda with 13 animals. So clearly the well-intended CITES ban simply has not worked and we are flogging a dead horse here and it is time for a radical review of policy strategy and intervention to try to save this iconic species before they're only referred to in zoos and in picture books. Michael says, Rolls, is that your thoughts as well? It has been a dismal failure, the site is banned. Uh, I would have to agree that for the most part the ban has been a failure. Um, there was a short period from the mid-90s for about 10 years when the ban appeared to be working after a domestic um, ban was placed in the, in the key consumer countries, but that was short-lived and we've seen the situation deteriorate again. And even though poaching numbers are starting to stabilize, it is coming at an enormous financial cost to conservation which is simply not sustainable. The ban has been a failure in your words. What has made it so though? Why is it having any impact since 1977? The main reason that it has been a failure is that it has um, 
it has not addressed the, the nature of the demand for rhino horn. It has simply pushed up the price. So for example, in 1977, the, the, the wholesale price of rhino horn was about 30 US dollars a kilogram. Today it is um, easily 30,000 US dollars a kilogram. So what the ban has done is it simply made rhino horn a more attractive commodity on the black market and fueled this enormous growth in organized crime to, to supply the market. And, and that in turn is paid for, for poaching. Dr. John Hanks, your thoughts on that? I absolutely agree with both Pelham and, and Mike Sass Rolves. The ban has been a failure. And I think we must realize that the only people who have benefited from a trade ban have been the illegal criminal syndicates. The people who are charged with looking after the rhinos, what we call the rain states, and in the rain states there's the private sector, and also, of course, there um, are some of the communities, and more importantly, the national parks. They're all losing because they're not getting any revenue back from their rhinos. And as long as the criminal syndicate is the only people who are benefiting from from what is happening now, we're not going to get it right. And that's the challenge that we face. Right, so to you all, the sentiment is that the CITES ban has pretty much not worked. It has been a dismal failure. But if you look at the rhino numbers, Pelham Jones, though, um, according to Save the Rhino, the numbers of poached rhinos in 2018 was at 769. And now that is down from the numbers of 2014 at 1,000. 215. So there has been a decline though in the numbers of poached rhinos. So that statistic is a little bit misleading in so far as you must appreciate we South Africa have a declining population so therefore for the poachers to be successful particularly in properties like Kruger National Park they are not as easy to find as as they used to. That is the first aspect. The second aspect is what those statistics are not telling you is that the number of poacher incursions, in other words, the endeavors by illegal killing, has in fact substantially increased year on year. So whilst the, um, uh, uh, the enforcement agencies, the anti-poaching uh, units, etc., are doing an exceptionally good job, they are having to work so much harder to stop the uh, poaching figures from, 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 from escalating. So the demand is very much there and is perpetual. Dr. John Hanks, your thoughts on this debate, though, be, uh, because, uh, you know, to legalize or not to legalize on the domestic scene, South Africa is considering that. What are your thoughts? I'm totally in support of legalizing the trade and setting it up very carefully. And I must say, so are most of my colleagues who have worked in rhino conservation most of their lives. And I'm talking about people who've worked at the coalface of conservation, resource economists and scientists. Now there's one point hasn't been made, and I must make this right at the start. Um, Pelham talked about stockpiles being sold and horns coming from other places, but let's look at the reality of a rhino horn. I hope you can see this here. Rhinos can have their horns removed painlessly. The animals are immobilized, the horn can be cut off, and because there are no nerves going into the horn, there is no pain. An antidote is given, the animal gets up and moves away. Now, the horn then regrows, and so many people don't appreciate this. In about 18 months, another, round about one kilogram of horn can grow from the piece that's being cut off. And this can be done eight times in the animal's life, at least, if not more. That provides a lot of additional horn to the market. Think of the alternative. A poacher kills the animal, it's dead, horn is removed, and that's it. We're talking about a sustainable source of horn, which so many people simply have not appreciated. Dr. John Hanks, you, you, you have uh, talked about uh, the, the concept of dehorning uh, as a method of saving the rhino, but even with dehorning though, it has not drastically reduced uh, uh, poaching because more than 7,000 rhinos have been killed in South Africa in the past decade. So exactly how viable is dehorning in conservation? Well, dehorning is just one of the options that people have tried um, as a deterrent initially to poaching. Rhinos, I say, are mobilized, the horn is cut off. And here, the thought is that if a poacher sees a rhino without a horn, it will, um, the poacher will move away and not kill it. Unfortunately, it has not always worked because even the small remaining bit of horn is often enough for a poacher to kill the animal. It has been a deterrent. 
but there is no one system that is going to be perfect for everything. We have to look at a combination of things, and this is something I think we must discuss later on. If there is a legal trade, how is it going to be set up? How is it going to be managed? How are we going to deal with corruption and the export and import of horns? Right. Uh, Pelham Jones, uh, your thoughts on this uh, issue of uh, dehorning, though? Uh, is it really a drastic deterrent from poaching? We are now seeing that in, in national parks they are starting to dehorn even females as an attempt to, to, to reduce the risk on those prime breeding animals. So clearly these are desperate measures um, called for in very desperate times because we are seeing a decline in our population. So that is why uh, uh, at this moment in time all the profits go to the criminal syndicates. We are in desperate need for funding that is on national, provincial as well as private reserves. As I indicated earlier on, we are spending billions of rand annually in, in, in security. So we are saying that we will not easily reduce or shut down the demand for the horn. There's a certain cultural aspect, a little bit like in, in Africa, we have traditional medicines. Um, and you cannot simply come to Africa or to North America and say to uh, uh, rural communities there that you must stop using particular medicines, etc. Whether we believe in it or not, we simply cannot force Western medicines into certain cultures. So whilst there is a demand, and we are very happy to see the demand reduced, we say if we can su legally supply horn through a transparent, regulated, controlled uh, system whereby we have DNA certification, in other words, we're able to prove at any point in the transaction chain whether that horn came from a poached animal, in other words, an illegally killed animal, or whether it came from a stockpile or from a dehorning or whatever the case may be. So we believe that as exactly the situation with prohibition in America on alcohol, right. through a regulated supply, we can shut down the illegal trade and bring revenue back to conservation and to uh, very, very needy communities who are, are pivotal in our conservation strategies across Africa. Michael Sazros, do you agree on that thought, that a regulated uh, supply in rhino horn would make it less lucrative? I, I agree that in principle, if it is done correctly, it should make a difference because it would provide the, um, it, it would turn the tables, the financial tables. At the moment, as, the, as my colleagues have said, all the money is being made by criminals. Um, and rhinos are, are just a huge cost and a huge liability to the national parks and the private owners who look after them. If they are able to recoup some of those costs through the, through the sale, through the legal sales of horns, then, then that certainly, I think, would, would help those owners. Of course, there are um, parks um, elsewhere in the world that have rhinos. Uh, if they do not benefit from the system, they would obviously be less inclined to support uh, this kind of approach. Dr. John Hanks in, in, in Cape Town, is that your sentiment as well, that a regulated supply is needed uh, and that it can actually make a difference in poaching and in conservation efforts for the rhino? I think it's absolutely essential because both other speakers have touched on the financial implications. Every single national park today in Africa is underfunded. Pelham mentioned the enormous high costs of looking after rhinos, even in the private, small um, private sector areas. It's costing them up to a million rand a month on field protection. It is not sustainable. And let me tell you, I think there is real donor fatigue. There are so many NGOs out there now saying, help us save the rhino. You give them $1,000 and they come back um, next year asking for more. And people will say, well, I've given you $1,000. It hasn't made any difference. What's the alternative? And we have to also realize the fact that it's not going to get any better in Africa. There is massive poverty throughout the whole continent. Governments have enormous priorities to deal with issues of food security, employment, job creation, hospitals, and so on. And unfortunately, conservation is way down on the agenda. Where is the money going to come from in the future? And bear in mind that Africa also has the fastest population growth rate of any region in the world. 1.4 billion people now will be well over 4 billion right. by the end of this century. And that is the realities we have to face. 
Right, uh, gentlemen, we'll leave it there for the moment and take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation on lifting the ban on rhino trade. Stay tuned. China Global Television Network. From broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms, and social media. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue our discussion on lifting the ban on rhino horn trade. Still with me are Michael Saz rolfs from Oxford. He's a conservation economist in Johannesburg. Pelham Jones, the chairman of the Private Rhino Owners Association. And from Cape Town, zoologist Dr. John Hanks. Pelham Jones, uh, i start off with a comment by the African Wildlife Foundation. And their stand is clear. They say legalizing any rhino trade would be sending mixed messages to the marketplace. And that rhino trade should be illegal and that each single horn comes at the cost of an irreplaceable rhino life. What would you say? Well, this is unfortunately where we now start to get into what I refer to as the emotive speculative. Now, if you pull back in terms of the way we should be making decisions, it should be fact-based, science-based information. So we, we hear individuals, and this goes more to the environment of uh, uh, Mike Sass Rolfs, who is the, the economist, and he can talk more in terms of the risk of growing markets, etc. But just to, 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 to tell you that we uh, have tried to shut down this illegal trade for some 40 odd, odd years. So we are now saying that we have had thousands of meetings, workshops, position papers, etc. Are they saving rhinos' lives? No, they are not. So therefore, up until now, a lot of these are assumptive, speculative statements. We could tomorrow, if we were allowed to start to, to, to trade from the, the stockpile that we have, we could bring some four billion US dollars into our conservation economy, which includes beneficiation to rural communities, etc. So unfortunately, the speculation that we hear from certainly these animal rights NGOs do not help us because they simply create what we could refer to as a fear factor, create added uncertainty and delay ultimate decision making. Why must we debate this for another 40 years and still not have a constructive outcome? This is our out of the box plan B thinking. And that is our appeal to the conservation world. Right. Uh, Michael Sass Jones, we are stuck in this polarizing debate. Why do you think, though, that the whole concept and the whole question of legalizing rhino horn trade, why is it so polarizing? That's a very interesting question. So I think there are two reasons. Um, I think one is that people like to simplify issues. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, the rhino trade issue is tied to a lot of other very emotive and contentious issues like uh, legalizing the ivory trade or, or, or trading in other animal wildlife species. So one approach has been to, uh, it's very much like drug prohibition in the 1970s, one approach has just been to say no to everything, to say no to absolutely everything, we must just stop all use of wildlife. And there is a strong movement um, pushing this. I think another problem is the media quite frankly, because the media often, when they, when they discuss these issues, they like to frame them as debates. And so they will, they will, they will cast certain people as pro-traders and other people as anti-traders. And when, when, when these discussions are actually staged as debates, right. then people lock down. And we, and, and we see the polarization intensify. What would be the drawbacks, though, of legalizing uh, the rhino horn trade? So it's, it's, uh, there are obviously risks involved, but those risks can be addressed and they can be mitigated depending on how the legalization is done and how it is set up. If you simply draw a line through the rule books and say, right, we've got open free trade, uh, that is potentially quite risky. But if you set up the trade in a structured way to ensure that the funds were recycled back into conservation where they are needed, then it could be a very powerful instrument. So the devil is very much in the detail. Pelham Jones, do you see any risks if uh, the trade is legalized? 
So we have already, because of the legal trade that we have in South Africa, um, as was mentioned earlier on by, by Mike Sasserolfs, we have an incredibly uh, well-documented process um, which shows transparency, full disclosure of details of the buyer, the seller, etc. So um, we're in a situation of if we continue the way we are, we're on a failed path, a, 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 a pathway to extinction. Um, or certainly a, a, a massive fall of a population. So this is the out-of-box um, approach. And we believe that the module that we've developed here in South Africa, in fact, can be exported and utilized internationally to comply with both uh, a CITES permit control measures, to be able to prove origin of the horn, to turn the illegal uh, role players into legitimate uh, role players in this uh, transaction and to be able, as we indicated earlier on, to bring revenue back to, to, to conservation. So we we saying this is a desperate move, we acknowledge that, but nothing else is working. And we must also remember that trade is not the silver bullet. It will form part of a composite of conservation in initiatives, of which the trade component is merely one of them. Right. Uh, Dr. John Hanks, it does seem that uh, as Pelham Jones says, it does seem that this is a desperate measure, though. But do you not think that there's a danger that a legalized trade uh, would open up the market for illegal activity, for instance, become uncontrollable? It very much depends on, as Mike Sassroff has said, on how the trade is set up. It's not an easy system to do. There is no um, obvious solution has been proposed right now. But this must be explored, and it's part of a total package. Obviously, um, an investment into field protection is not going to stop. We have to deal with issues of corruption. We have to deal with one most important point that has not really been mentioned. How do we get communities involved in this? Because all these people living in poverty around where rhinos live have got to benefit from this. And there's some very solid proposals that have been put up whereby communities can benefit financially from being part of a sustainable utilization program. If one looks what has happened in Namibia, right. with the very successful work that's been done there, there are models that work well. But it's not going to happen overnight. And as Pelham said, this is just part of a strategy that involves a lot of other components that must be addressed. Right. Uh, Michael, of course, we are talking about this uh, uh, regarding much of Southern African area. And, and maybe South Africa uh, might be able to have the regulations in place. But isn't there a danger, though, that a legalized trade market, uh, a legalized trade in rhino horn would open up markets to illegal activity? The, the whole point about creating a legal market is that it creates competition for criminals. At the moment, the criminals have a complete monopoly on the trade. So as long as there is demand, they are the monopolists supplying the demand. What you're trying to do is make it a less profitable business for them. And the, the way, and by creating these legal markets, you're actually competing with them. Uh, so when, when you introduce that competition and an increased supply of horn from the massive stockpiles that South Africa is sitting on at the moment, then uh, it, it, it makes their whole business model less viable. They no longer are able to afford to spend as much on smuggling, on poaching, and so forth. And so you, you gradually compete with them and put them out of business. But it's a process. So it's been quite uh, a robust debate here, that, uh, one that will nonetheless will be discussed at the upcoming CITES conference. So that conference uh, upcoming this year, of course, will be receiving proposals on whether to remove the ban on rhino or horn trade. So Pelham Jones, to start off with you, what are your expectations uh, for that uh, CITES conference? Well, sadly, the South African government at the last minute did not submit a, a trade proposal or a correction of our um, annotation on our, our, our Appendix 2 species, which has to do with the trade in the specimen of the species being the horn. So we are going there uh, to try to educate members to the best of our ability to give full support to the Esatwini uh, proposal, Swaziland's proposal, um, who are going for a full trade proposal, as well as that of Namibia. Namibia are putting in a proposal to get the same uh, uh, site status as, as South Africa and Swaziland. So unfortunately, 
societies is a very complex, very politicized environment, and the tragedy is that a range state like South Africa, which holds currently about 90% of the, con the continent's total rhino population, a country, let's refer to it as Qatar, is able to vote, and the vote of a country is able to negate the vote of South Africa as a range state, if that makes sense to you. So we are very, very concerned about the politics, the um, influence by animal rights NGOs in decision making that should be facts fact and science based and it now becomes an emotive assumptive discussion and unfortunately it detracts us in our decision making and it becomes again as you referred earlier on to the polarization. So certainly we are going there not that we can hope to get a, um, a trade proposal because there are clear regulations and parameters by when proposals need to be um, submitted but certainly if one looks at the, the winds of change in so southern Africa, particularly the SADAC region, where you see Namibia, right. uh, you see Botswana, you see Zimbabwe, you see Zambia, all making very strong statements to say, uh, you know, your conservation policies in North America and Europe, or even in East Africa, may not be successful in, in Southern Africa. Be understanding of our conservation needs. So if there is a declining er elephant population in an East African country, you cannot simply apply that same principle to a country like Botswana that is currently sitting with massive uh, overpopulation problems. So these are the kinds of, of uh, segmented debates that we have to bring through and try to uh, make members realize that it is not as simple as black and white. Not as simple as black and white. Uh, Dr. John Hanks, your thoughts, what will you be expecting out of the CITES conference? Well, I would hope that the delegates to CITES would start to listen to the countries that have rhino populations that have to be managed because it makes sense that people who live and work in South Africa, in um, Eswatini or Swaziland, in Namibia, in Zimbabwe, who've got many years experience, believe a legal trade is the way to go. And I think, unfortunately, CITES has been dictated to by people who do not have rhinos on their doorstep and have to live with them. And I have a lovely quote here from the president of Botswana. I'd like to read it to you. It's very short. He said, it bamboozles me when people sit in the comfort of where they come from and lecture us about how the management of species they don't have. And I think that says a lot. In other words, he's saying, listen to us. We have the animals we have to deal with on a daily basis. If our recommendation is that a legal trade is the way to go with all the safeguards that should be put in place, please give this serious thought. I think right. we have to try to get away from this polarization that people have referred to. You have the approach from mainly East Africa and the approach from the Southern African countries. They're doing this. They're hitting each other or they're talking past each other. Surely the time has come when we should say, let's try to listen to each other, join together like this, because we all want the same thing. Whether we're pro-trade or anti-trade, we all want rhinos to be here for the future. Doc, uh, Michael Assas of Rolls, you have the final word. Uh, I would say that for CITES, I'm somewhat pessimistic. I think uh, it's going to be dominated again by a very polarized discussion about elephants. Uh, I think well, there will be some discussion about rhinos. But um, I, I have to say at this stage, I'm still somewhat pessimistic. I think we've got a way to go to move beyond polarization. But let's hope. Gentlemen, a very robust debate indeed. And that conversation will continue. And, but that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts, Michael saz rolfs from Oxford. He's a conservation economist in Johannesburg. Pelham Jones, chairman of the Private Rhino Owners Association. And from Cape Town, Dr. John Hanks. He's a zoologist. Remember, you can be part of this conversation online through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And do join us again next week for more Talk Africa. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Until next time, goodbye.